Hi everyone, I'm Stuart Spinks and welcome to episode 32 of my podcast, Beekeeping Short and Sweet. This week, it's our regular monthly questions and answers session. Beekeeping Short and Sweet, a beekeeping podcast for the inquisitive beekeeper with a short attention span. A beekeeper, in fact, just like me. Welcome once again to my weekly podcast, and my thanks to those of you listening via the Patreon page. I really appreciate your support. If you're not familiar with Patreon, it's a support page where you can help me create more content by signing up to one of my reward tiers, and in return, you gain access to additional content and support from me. These start from as little as $1 per month, so I believe with the regular quality content I'm producing, $1 represents excellent value for money. If you've not yet started beekeeping and you're looking for help and assistance, pop over to my website www.norfolk-honey.co.uk forward slash get started and I'll do all I can to help you out with suggestions and recommendations for you. As usual, I'll leave any relevant links for this week's podcast in the show notes. So this month we've got plenty of questions, so let's just crack on with the very first one, which is from Leslie Creed. And she says, Hi Stuart, I've just put a mated queen into a nuke on Saturday. She's still in the cage with attendance and fondant. There's no stopper in the end of the cage. Will she emerge by herself or should I help her out? So hi Leslie and thanks for the question. The type of queen cages I use have a little tab to break off the end which allows the workers to eat their way through the fondant. So I'm assuming that... Uh, That's what you're referring to when you say there's no stopper on the end of the cage. What I also do is push a matchstick through the fondant to give them an easy route to chew their way through. And I usually give them three or four days to uh, sort themselves out. And by that time, uh, they've normally chewed their way through. But I I would always go back in and check uh, just to make sure that things are okay after that amount of time. If the workers are still struggling to get through the fondant, maybe it's it's gone hard. Uh, sometimes I use slightly older fondant and it does tend to go a little bit firm. As long as the bees are uh, ignoring the queen and she's still sat in the cage, what I tend to do is to just release her onto a frame. So just slide back the top of the queen cage and just let her walk out onto the frame and just watch her closely. If there's any signs of aggression from the workers, just pick her up by the wings and pop her back into the cage for another day or two, and then check again. But normally what happens is she'll just wander off, the bees will ignore her, and you've introduced a queen. So I hope that uh, that helps you out, and good luck with that introduction of a queen. Next up is Greg Palmer, who says, Hi Stuart, I would like to ask how many seams of bees you consider strong enough for the winter? I'm running BS Nationals, all of which have a super on that the bees are currently filling with syrup. Also, they are bringing back what I believe to be pollen from Himalayan balsam. Thanks, Greg. Well, hi, Greg, and it's a great question. And of course, it's quite a tricky one to answer definitively. Again, we're into the different types of bees that are out there and how they each overwinter. But from my own personal experience, I can tell you that I've had Colonies go into the winter with 10 seams of bees, and those have died. And colonies in mating nukes, so just three frames with two seams of bees, and they've survived and gone on to flourish the following spring. So there's no easy answer, really. This last winter, in particular, I had a large colony in late autumn that were on around 9 or 10 seams of bees, and they just seemed to dwindle down to around one or two seams by late February and eventually there was less than one seam of bees in there and I was certain that they were done for especially as we had to get through the beast from the east remember that this year anyway they struggled through survived the beast and went on to grow through the spring and into the summer they didn't produce any honey in the spring but I had four very full supers from them in the summer Again, as I speak, they're on 11 very full seams of bees. But again, I've got no idea how they'll cope with this winter. I guess time will tell. Having said all of that, for me, any colony in a full-size hive with less than half a full brood box 
gets united with another colony. So I guess if they've only got maybe five frames of bees, then I'm going to unite them. I'm also running all of my national beehives with supers this year, so we'll see how they get on. Last year we suffered some losses because I just had uh, national brood boxes with no supers on. So we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on that. The Himalayan balsam is really interesting as it usually leaves the bees with a little pale strip of pollen on their thorax, so it's quite easy to spot. It's a pale cream colour if that helps. Next question is from Ian Haslam. Ian says, Hi Stuart. I've been successfully raising a laying queen in Apidea from a sealed queen cell that has progressed to a five-frame nuke with frame feeder. This nuke is very full with three frames of sealed brood that is going to need a lot of space in a day or so. I need to move it into a full brood box but have no drawn comb. Do I use foundation and feed? Do I use dummies to only try and draw one comb at a time? Do I put the foundation frame in the middle of the brood nest to encourage, or is this too disruptive at this time of the year? Well, first off, Ian, congratulations on raising your own queen. It's really satisfying, isn't it, when you take a queen cell and see it end up as a thriving colony in its own right. The trick now is to get it through the winter. Getting bees to draw comb at this time of year can be tricky, as a lot depends on the weather. Having said that, if you feed continuously and the weather holds, it is possible I would consider leaving them in the nuke box as an overwintered nuke, perhaps, unless you feel they are too strong, in which case I would move them into the full-size hive. Don't disrupt the brood nest. Uh, Backfill either side with frames of foundation and feed heavy syrup constantly. Make sure that they don't run out of syrup and check them after a week or so. With any luck and with some fair weather, they'll have drawn a fair proportion of the foundation. If they look like they're struggling, you can always remove the outer frames and add dummy boards, uh, and I would do that on either side to keep them tightly packed together. But hopefully, they'll get it drawn before the end of this month. Our next question is from Adrian Fletcher, who says, Hi Stuart, what's the best way of building up the bees for the winter, and is there still time to do that for those of us here in Norfolk, UK? And for those of you that don't know, that's where I live, Norwich, Norfolk in the UK. All of my hives have reasonable stores in supers, but when should we start feeding? Hi Adrian, and thanks for the question. I'm going to make an assumption that you have national beehives, and each one has a single super on as the starting point. So my preparations for winter are as follows. I would treat the bees for varroa if needed. I usually do that in August. You could still get away with it through September if you're quick. Make sure the colonies are queen right and large enough to go into the winter. And then I feed colonies in September with heavy sugar syrup. That's two parts sugar to one part water mix. Now is the time the ivy starts to flower. So the bees will be packing away that yellow pollen, but it also produces a lot of nectar. And I try to get a decent amount of syrup into them now before any of the ivy nectar goes in. And so the outer frames have more sugar syrup than ivy. As long as you can do that, it doesn't then allow the ivy a chance to granulate and form what I'd call a starvation bridge that the bees can't move across in the depth of winter. Another question from Ian Haslam. Do you have a plan as to how to clean the poly hives? You cannot scorch, obviously, but scrubbing with bleach seems a lot of work. Yeah, that's absolutely right, Ian. Poly hives and naked flames don't really go together terribly well, so I'll not be scorching them as you suggest. Instead, I'll be using my frame boiling drum and giving them a really good scrub in a hot washing soda mix before using a final wash of a product that I've got called Eversafe Bee Care and Hive Wash. The manufacturers claim it to be, and I quote, formulated for the complete bee and honey production environments, including polyhives. This concentrated cleaner sanitizer is a powerful tried and tested bactericidal, viricidal and fungicidal product. So the washing soda works really well at removing the propolis and wax, especially if you're using good hot water. And then the hive wash is what I would use just to kill off any of the bugs that might be lingering around. Details of the Eversafe product can be found on various beekeeping supply websites. I get mine from Maysmore Apiaries and I'll pop a link in the description to take you straight to the product. So now we've got several questions from Fran Barham. 
Hi, Fran. And Fran says, is it too late to requeen a struggling colony? I believe I have a drone laying queen and don't really want to combine this colony with another one. I would love to keep it going as a separate entity so that I have the same number of colonies coming out next spring. Hi, Fran. Uh, No, it's not too late to requeen a struggling colony is the easy answer. But just be sure you're not wasting a queen on a colony that can't be saved. Depending on how long the drone laying queen has been in that state, she may well be too short of workers by now. As long as there are plenty of workers still in the colony and you can remove and replace any frames with drone brood in them, I would go ahead. Otherwise, I would shake them out and start over again in the spring. Of course, that's easy for me to say because I've got plenty of colonies and I can make up replacements quite easy and make up my numbers in the spring. For those with just a handful of colonies, the temptation is always to try to coax them all through the winter, but the reality is that you're just delaying the inevitable in most cases, and this costs you just time and money in the long run. So just make sure you've got plenty of bees in there before you make the decision to requeen. The next question from Fran is, Help me understand, is it true that using frames with queen cells is fine if you have a few hives, say up to 10, but you're not going to get the same queen quality that you would from grafting? Also, consider why do bees build queen cells? Usually because they're preparing to swarm. So, are we recreating more swarmy bees? So, Fran, that's a really good question, and one that when I'm holding my teaching groups particularly the queen rearing groups uh, with beekeepers who've not raised queens before we talk about all the time. Queen cells are produced for many different reasons. As you say it could simply be that they're trying to reproduce and swarm but it could be that the queen is getting old and needs to be replaced naturally. She may be damaged or lost and you won't be surprised to know that many beekeepers find queen cells and no eggs a week after they last inspected their bees having not spotted that the queen was on the lower side of a frame when they put it back into the brood box, crushing her against the adjacent frame or side wall. So here's the thing. You can spend a load of time and money getting everything set up for queen rearing. You graft larvae into cell cups. You set up your other preferred method. Somehow the queen cells just don't look like anything as good as the queen cells the colony produced when they were trying to swarm. It happens to me all the time. So one of my favourite ways of producing queens is the two nukes from one parent colony method or variation of that, which relies on swarm cells. You may have seen the video that I produced on YouTube demonstrating exactly this process. Swarm cells are absolutely perfect for producing great queens, but you have to think about your approach first and question, is this the right colony to be producing queens from? As you point out, you might just be producing more swarmy colonies to have to manage later in the year. I know it's true because some years ago I did just that. Most colonies will attempt to swarm at some point, and when they do, you have to make a judgment on the quality of the colony, the traits that they have, and then weigh up the pros and cons as to whether you want more queens from that same maternal line. If I find a queen cell in a colony that also has a laying queen, I immediately think, is this one of my better colonies? Are they top of my ranking system? Are they in my A grade class of colonies? If they are, I check to see how many swarm cells there are. And if there are more than 8 to 12, I won't use them. I once had 58 swarm cells in one colony, and that's my personal record. And there's no way that I'm going to reproduce queens from a colony like that. In actual fact, I only found 57 cells, and they swarmed on the 58th. I think that fewer than 8 to 12 cells is perfectly adequate and I will split the colony down and make up some nukes to use the queen cells. Queen rearing can be as simple and as effective as that. Fran goes on to say, sorry, another question from me. Can we talk about how much feed you give your bees at the mow? What size feeder? How regularly? Also, I don't have a spare super with honey in it and therefore will only rely on syrup or fondant to feed my bees. Is it an idea to load an empty super on anyway and then let the bees store the syrup in those frames for winter or is it just as effective to feed them directly with a contact or other feeder? So this is a really timely question, Fran. I'm currently giving my bees around 10 to 14 kilos of heavy sugar syrup as an average and I'm using 
the Maysmore Jumbo Rapid Green Feeder. Uh, that's my standard feeder. I have got others and I've got a few bucket contact feeders as well. But the Jumbo Green Feeder is what I tend to go with. I started feeding at the beginning of the second week of September and I'll be finished by the end of the month. On all of my national beehives, I'll have a super of drawn comb that the bees are now filling with syrup and this then goes under the brood box once I've filled it. So yes, if you haven't saved a super of honey to give back to the bees, I would add a drawn super and feed them syrup. Our next question comes from Steve Hancock, who says, I'm moving several hives and setting up an apiary at my works this weekend. Hopefully it's not too late in the year to do it. Any advice that you have on how to go about this would be appreciated. Well, hi, Steve. Uh, timing is everything with setting up an apiary. And there's no big problem with setting it up at this time of the year. You can move bees around at any time of the year, really. Just make sure that you're well prepared and the new apiary site is all set and ready to have the hives delivered and put in place with the minimum of fuss. It's probably an obvious thing to say, but at this time of the year, make sure you get them moved before you start feeding them. You don't want to have feeders full of syrup sloshing around, adding weight to the hives that you have to lift and potentially spilling syrup all over the bees and yourself as you move them. Other than that, there's no real problem with setting up an apiary at this time of the year. Good luck with it. I'm sure it will all go fine. Steve Galpin uh, has sent in a question, and he says, I have a strong hive which produced 80 pounds of honey. I've found the queen laying in the super with two frames of brood and plenty of stores. But in the brood box, which is now above the super, two frames of capped brood, but totally empty of stores. I have a feeder fitted. Approximately how much feed would you suggest, or would you keep feeding until the bees tell me? Well, Steve, it sounds like you've got a really nice colony there, and a productive colony as well. If the brood box is almost empty of stores, I would use a full jerry can of syrup on them. So mine contain 14 kilos of syrup, and it's surprising how much the bees can take down and store but just check up on them and if they need more then you can always let them have some more the brood nest is going to be receding now so there's little chance of blocking cells that the queen is likely to be laying in so i would just go ahead add a feeder and get them plenty of syrup so that they can fill as many of those brood frames with stores as possible Chris Clark asks, just wondering what your procedure is for overwintering to give the bees the best chance to get through a really cold snap. Do you insulate at all? I know last year I put a square sheet of poly insulation above the crime board and cut out a section to allow for fondant. It seemed to do the trick due to the roof surface being warmer. Any condensation tended to be on the sides of the hive. Do you think it's not necessary? It would be interesting to hear your thoughts. Thanks, Chris. Hi Chris, uh, again a really good timely question and one that I know a lot of beekeepers will be wondering about at this time of the year. The issue of insulation is an interesting one. I know lots of beekeepers who do use insulation and they believe it helps their bees to overwinter better than if they don't use it. Personally I've never used it on my hives and I don't feel it's something I need to use. Perhaps this year I'll set up a few colonies with some insulation in them and see what effect it has. As I say, it's not something that I've done before. Uh, it would be a, a really good exercise as I have no experience. It may well be that I'm missing a trick here and could get my bees through the winter in even better condition than I already do. Another question from Steve Galpin. Could you share a few tips on storage of drawn brood frames and supers? Thanks for the question, Steve. I've used up all of my drawn brood frames this autumn, moving nukes into full-size hives, so I don't have any to store. But if I did, I'd just keep them in the same way that I keep my supers and super frames, which is stacked securely in all of my apiaries. I use a pallet, uh, a simple wooden pallet, held up on bricks off the floor to allow some air to flow beneath them. And I place a travel screen on the base of the pallet, and stack the supers on top of that screen. This prevents the unwanted visitors from getting in, particularly mice. What you don't want is all of that hard work that the bees have put in to draw out the frames being undone really quickly by mice that set up home inside a stack of supers. It's really soul-destroying when you see it. 
Finally, a crime board and roof go on top to keep the weather out, and I secure the stack with a ratchet strap to the pallet to prevent strong winds from blowing it over, and then wrap the outside with chicken wire if it's in an apiary that I know has had previous green woodpecker issues. The last thing you want, again, is to stack a load of supers and find that a woodpecker has punched a hole through the side. But that's it. I leave them out in the cold weather, which hopefully kills off any of the bugs. And one final question from Fran. And she says, OK, last one from me, thymol crystals. What's the best solution to stop sugar syrup from going mouldy? I have seen thymol crystal oil on Amazon, but not sure if this is the right stuff. OK, Fran, thanks for the question. Uh, I find that, first of all, the heavy sugar syrup that I'm using to feed the bees for the winter has such a high level of sugar in it that in most cases the syrup prevents the moulds from growing in the first place. So generally speaking, I tend not to use thymol in the sugar syrup to prevent mould from growing. However, if you wanted to use some, I would suggest caution as it is very easy to use too much and you can kill a lot of bees if you're feeding using a rapid feeder. What happens is the thymol vapour can settle out above the syrup and when the bees move into the feeder to access the syrup, they suffocate in the thymol vapour. Better to use a contact feeder if you're just mixing in uh, thymol into your sugar syrup. And that's the one with the bucket and a mesh gauze in the lid that sits upside down over the crime board. If you use it that way, the vapour then sits at the top of the bucket safely away from the bees. I have seen several recipes out there on the internet which suggest using lecithin uh, to emulsify the thymol solution with the syrup, and that apparently prevents the separation from occurring. So it would be good to check that out. I've not used any of those recipes, but I think what I will do is see if I can find a recipe and I'll produce a video for everyone on Patreon showing the mixing up of the solution and how that goes and, and what it turns out like. And I'll do that in the next week or two. So do look out for that. And hopefully we'll be able to try out that method and see if it's any more effective than just adding the thymol crystals in solution to the sugar syrup. Well, that's it for this week. I hope you'll excuse me overrunning our normal 15 minute maximum slot. But I really wanted to answer all of the questions that you guys had taken time to post. So we'll catch up next time. But for now, I'm Stuart Spinks, and that was beekeeping, not so short, but sweet. <laughs>